What's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of the 5280 Podcast on the MHRT Network. I am your host, Mandunga Screevy. Get in my belly! <laughs> and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Cameron Parker, Gage Madrid, and Glenn Hauser. How are we doing, fellas? We gotta, we gotta, yeah, we gotta give some love to your new T-shirt, Mike, because that is that's uh, some epic stuff. Big Debra. Big Debra. <laughs> that will go down in MHR if team. If you keep eating little Debbies, you'll become Big Debra. That's right. That's why. That's we why have I'm booty cakes it. and uh, snack cakes on on the on the show tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> no booty cheeks. Absolute booty uh, cheeks. That's right. <laughs> All right, I botched that. Yeah, <laughs> toxic mean lore. Uh, uh, all right, so we have a little bit of news here before we get to the mock draft. Um, we did end up signing a new guard. Uh, what was it? Two days ago? Yesterday? Mm -hmm. Yesterday. Something like that. Uh, Calvin Throckmorton. I love that name. Throckmorton. Yeah. Uh, and he comes that. over from the Saints. Um, so another Saint joining the Broncos. I mean, did we think any different? Yeah. See, it seems pretty easy, right? <laughs> to, to predict on that. He did start what? He started 14 games for the Saints with, when Peyton was there. I want to say. So I'm assuming he's just a backup, right? Oh, yeah. It's it's a depth signing. But yeah, it's 27 in total. Like he, he did 27 in total. But it's a fun little tie in. He was on, on the offensive line with Alex Forsythe at Oregon. Could be all tying that Oregon pipeline together with Bo Nix, man. Oregon center. Oregon depth guard. I mean, I do indeed like this Calvin Throckmorton signing. I think that he's going to provide some nice quality depth on the interior offensive line. This isn't somebody that we should hope is going to start a lot of games for the Broncos because we want to keep our interior intact. But if Throckmorton has to go in there, clearly Peyton has confidence in him. Once again, I feel like I have to state this every time we sign a former Saints player. These are just guys that Sean Peyton's familiar with, comfortable with, and trust. Yeah. So that's another scenario here, and Throckmorton should hopefully not play much of a factor, but if he does, I think he'll play well. The only way that name would be Morton, better... get in my it, belly! We got to add, like, the third to that, Throckmorton the third. You know, the third. Like, <laughs> but, um, Gage, do you think there's a possibility that he... <laughs> do you think there's a possibility he, he competes at center? I'm honestly not sure his acumen at that position in college. It was Alex Forsyth, the center at Oregon. So maybe, but I think this is just more to have some depth at the two guard positions. I know he can play both left and right guard. You know, um, I, I was actually going to say this actually could spell bad news for a guy like uh, Luke Wattenberg, you know, and I know that, they, sure. and, and I know that they are, you know, high on him in the sense, like, you know, he's in contention for that center position, uh, but we know that if you're if you're really going off of between one of those two, who is the most versatile? It would be Wattenberg because Wattenberg had played some guard a little bit, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if it maybe kind of subtly puts maybe Wattenberg a little bit on notice uh, in terms of a hand picked depth signing. Um, so yeah, I, I would kind of maybe lean a little bit there, but I mean, again, it, it's way too early to tell. Uh, we're, we're we're talking about it like at the very very beginning of draft month, even before even things really even happen in the draft. That's because nothing is happening. <laughs> so boring. They will postpone. The All draft. right. So the other little bit and the other little bit of news that we got, and we're going to have to read into this one because we don't know what's actually going to happen. Yeah. Am I, am I stalling out? Baby. What the heck is going on? <laughs> uh, yeah. We can see the graphic. Yeah, April 22nd, uniforms are released. So a couple days before the draft. Now, obviously, they're sticking with orange, right? You can see that right there. Orange is sticking. Uh, but a couple things that have been brought to my attention. One is the numbers. 
Mm-hmm. Is is that going to be what our new numbers look like? Yeah, I, they, that was one of maybe the first things that that really caught my eye is the, the is the numbers. Uh, and then obviously, uh, not that it was a surprise, but when it came out that they that the that the logo wasn't necessarily going to change, like they weren't going to do like a full rebrand, you know, if you will, of the entire logo. Like clearly, that's that's going to stay. Maybe like a you know a retool, if you will, uh, of the logo. Maybe uh, you know could be certainly possible. The other one I think is that you got cursive, uh, a cursive lettering right below. The uh, the numbering, uh, so maybe some you know nice little cursive. Which hey, uh, if you're a teacher, who doesn't love cursive? Um, you know, bring back some cursive. I was hoping maybe it would be Pat Bowen's signature, honestly, because the Bengals did that with Paul Brown on their uniforms. I'm I was hoping the Broncos may give some nod to Pat Bowen on their uniforms. Yeah. Some some of the younger fans saw it and they said, "What's that?" And we had to tell them that it's cursive. But um, <laughs> I. I got to tell you, I love the number font. I love that. I hope that the, the loose, the loose ends there. I'm trying to figure out if that's a symbolic thing, if they're going to clean up the the loose ends, the the threads, you know, or these new threads. I don't know what what, (laughs) I'm trying to figure that, that out. That's kind of curious to me. Does it look a little like horse nostrils to you? Like if you're kind of maybe, maybe, I don't know. We are reaching on that one a little bit. That that's what we do. We reach. We create True. fake news. Uh well, and then you have yeah. So we call Cam Damani Reach, there, right? That's right. <laughs> you got the Broncos logo down, and then right above it, you have like the slightly different orange with that stitch that looks like a mountain peak. Am I reading into that too much? I don't you think are, so. I don't know. Like, I think it just looks more like. Based on a geo, geo, uh, geometric shape, it's literally just looks like a triangle to me. I would need it to actually kind of like, actually kind of you know somewhat look like a mountain for me to actually say, oh, that actually, you know, seems it looks more like a pyramid for me to actually say like, oh, it's it's maybe possibly a mountain. So, yeah. All right, and then uh, getting ready to go into the mock draft because that's going to take most of our time. Um, by the way, happy birthday to Zach Stevens, if I didn't throw that out there yet. Happy birthday, happy Zach. Happy birthday. birthday. Ooh. Happy birthday. Ooh, Cam, do your thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then he put, he put out a tweet a while ago that said, ESPN thinks the Broncos have the third worst roster in the entire NFL right now. So – Let's go Mike, from roll that the clip. into what, this the one. Absolute booty cheeks. That would be there it. <laughs> that is the state of the Broncos roster. So let's go from that into the whole point of the show. <laughs> the mock. I love the freeze frame there. Mock draft. I was gonna say it's it's a perfect you go. Free free. <laughs> uh is it is it in here right now? I don't uh sorry guys. <laughs> no, is there we go. There we go. Well, Mike just dropped. A mic just dropped. That's what we call a mic drop. That's literally what we would call a mic drop. Exactly. Um, All right. Uh, So in this particular scenario, everything that we've kind of talked about is this is everything that we think the Denver Broncos will do. And we are using the pro football focus draft simulator. Obviously, we know that um, the grades are pretty, you know, should we say, uh, not necessarily objective. They're more subjective than anything. And so we really don't necessarily care more about the the draft grades as much as, you know, really kind of filling out the roster. Yep. Um, Yeah, go ahead, Gage. What adjustments have been made for realism for this particular mock? So uh, as far as, you know, not uh, doing any sort of turbo speed uh, or turbo time, we'll save that for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, 
we have um, based on these settings, nothing's changed on the settings. So public versus PFF board, it's on to public versus PFF boards. The care for positional value is just a tick above less. And draft for needs is maybe one setting just before you go to more, uh, more on draft needs and a little bit on the, I should say, truly less on the randomness side uh, versus maybe just a little bit more. So if there's any way you guys want to change that, let me know. Sounds pretty good to me. You good with that, Glenn? Go for it, man. All right. Uh, and anybody in the chat, um, if you guys maybe feel maybe a certain way, uh, should I say maybe at a selection, you know, you know, along with, you know, uh, uh, Glenn and Gage and, uh, myself. And when Mike, uh, hops right in, um, you know, let us know. All right. Uh, we will kick off the draft. And again, it is a seven round mock. All right. Uh, let's, let's start it. Get Caleb off the board. Bye, Jaden. He's falling. He's falling. Oh, there he goes. No. Well, oh. So, oh boy. so the quarterback that is available <laughs> is JG McCarthy. And they came and keep in mind, this is a simulator. Um, so I think uh and in the trade scenario, the teams that are interested, funny enough, are the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, the Buffalo Bills, and the Kansas City Chiefs. Obviously, we wouldn't be trading in division. Uh, so it's really just about the Buffalo Bills and the Pittsburgh Steelers. However, I would probably tend to agree uh, that maybe we're staying put, right? Uh, we're, we're kind of maybe staying put in this kind of scenario, right? Oh, yeah. If one of those quarterbacks falls, even within just relative striking distance for the Broncos, they'll move up. But yeah. in a dream scenario, one of them would fall to 12 like this. So this could be fun. Yeah. Um, I, I would agree. I think you got to snag JJ at this point. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go back here to draft uh, a player. And, and just for, and we should actually just say just for kicks, um, as far as the best players that are available. Sure. Um, Let's go through and actually evaluate this. Brock Bowers. Yes, Ooh, Mr. Brock Bowers. Uh, Jer uh, Jershon Newton, Cooper DeGene, Quentin Mitchell, Mr. Popular, uh, in terms of the Broncos pick at 12 from the national perspective. Latu, Byron Murphy, Fatanu is there. Uh, Terry on Arnold, another popular pick in terms of wanting to go for a quarter, a cornerback. Nate Wiggins, Amarius Mims, Kool Aid, uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, Graham Barton. Those are kind of the top players, except for, of course, once you get to quarterback. So I think we've we've got our mind made up, and we will go with that quarterback. And so that means that JJ McCarthy will in fact be a Denver Bronco. Yep. And I, I, I think that uh, in these kinds of scenarios, I feel like I can see a scenario where a guy like J.J. McCarthy would actually fall. Because like, like in, in, in a real scenario, like for me, it's like I, I'm kind of like eyeballing what the Giants do, really. For sure. I'm kind of I'm eyeballing what the Giants really do in the, in the real world at six. Because if they don't take the quarterback, you are far less more likely to get your quarterback mm -hmm. at that you know, at that pick 12 or within the range that you can possibly trade up and get him, you know, that's going to be far less, you know, expensive compared to going up to like four, right. For the Cardinals or even three. Panics so. just went to the saints. Um, I was looking at the simulator and Bowers went to the Colts and I'm just picturing Anthony Richardson having an, a, a weapon like that to play with. We'll do yeah. a recap uh, of some of the players that were picked here too. All right, cool. Yeah, Brock Bowers, I can't imagine. There's some good players coming off the board right now. All right, here we go. Let's rock. Ooh, Spencer Rattler would have been available. That's right. Uh, so some of the players that were taken, so you do have... Uh, Dorless, I like him. Isaac. Yeah, I really like Isaac. Neeland. Kyrie Jackson's been a really popular one. Jalen Polk. Um, Aurorho uh, went to Green Bay. 
Jonathan Brooks, the one who famously went to pick 12 in uh, someone's April Fool's mock draft, <laughs> uh, uh, went to the uh, Buccaneers. Uh, Sanders went to the Dolphins. That's a fun pick. Yeah, um, as well. I do like him as well. Ricky Pearsall went Pearsall to Pearsall is a good one. Yeah, Pierce. Uh, if you're if you're keeping tabs on like obviously the Broncos didn't have a second round pick here, right? If the Broncos have a second round pick, I would file away Ricky Pearsall's name. He's got so many connections to the staff. I think his wide receiver coach actually in college was Keir Colbert. Uh, so certainly a name that I would be filing away. And of course, if the Broncos are going off this whole connection thing this this off season, there goes Penix, Roger oh. Rosengarten, Denver native. Keon Coleman to the Falcons. Oh my. Leggett to the um, Texans. Ooh. Jordan Every Morgan. Cooper. Jordan Morgan to the Titans. Oh, lad to the Chargers. Ooh, oh man. Mike's Mike's guy Nate Wiggins drops to thirty five in this one. Wait, did McCaffrey? I don't know, man. I wouldn't hate coming up for Wiggins. Yeah. Corner is definitely one of those. Uh, if you kind of lucked into you're getting maybe a, a top of the top of the uh, second round, I wouldn't mind getting a corner in your first round and then getting your quarter back, if you will, into the second round. Um, all right, what's our direction here? Um, Let's look at the board. Yep. So as far as top available, we do have Tavondre oh, yeah. Sweat, uh, Mister Four Hundred Pounder. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh Jalen Wright, a very, very popular name. In fact, um, he is actually supposed to have a top 30 visit with the Broncos, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we know that Sean Payton has loved uh Tennessee running backs before, right? Mr. Alvin Kamara came from the University of Tennessee. Blake Corum, Javon Baker. Oh man, that is like a wide receiver crush for me. I think that he's not even for me, he's not really ranked 76 on here. He's actually should be ranked a lot higher in the groups of like Troy Franklin's and so on and so forth. Blake Fisher uh, with tackle. Johnny Wilson, the very versatile wide receiver, possibly tight end. Another wide receiver, Jamari Thrash. Bucky Irving, and obviously another one of my favorites, Malachi Corley uh, there uh, at 85. Trey Benson, Cameron Kitchens. Do you guys have a certain position in mind that you guys would like to go to here? I think we've covered almost the basics of the top there. Um, I don't know, man. And with Tavondre Sweat being there, that's kind of the BPA situation on that one. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of those two that you see, if you see Corley succeed and become a Debo Samuel 2.0, yeah. that's going to be one like, oh, we passed on that dude. Yes. True, man. And same for Baker too. Because I feel like if you're, if you're going to be wanting to go within that range, uh, of wide receivers, I would uh, I would imagine you know this is roughly that sweet spot that you probably would want to go and either get maybe a, an offensive tackle, a wide receiver, um, or maybe even like a Tavondre Sweat if he if he's actually lasts that long. So I think uh, the three names that I'm kind of eyeballing here would be Corley, uh, Javon Baker. He's maybe uh, my draft crush, if you will, this year, along with Corley, uh, and uh, so Sweat Baker. Um, and Corley are my th are my three. And we know Sean oh, Payton's Corley. not afraid to address wide receiver with a premium pick, so this could be a situation here where he goes with a Corley or a Baker. Yeah. Uh, you do you, do you guys uh, want to go maybe with a with a wide receiver here, and maybe go a little bit maybe with some and drafting some of those LSU guys maybe a little bit later. Let's do a Corley. Uh, I, I, he's so versatile. I think that yeah. a player like that, and I think some of the other players that we're going to go for in the later rounds, the versatility aspect can't be overlooked in a Sean Payton offense. I, I think that the, the thing that makes Spencer Rattler went to the Raiders just there. Um, Seahawks sounds about right. Yeah. Um, I think that what makes Corley so fun you know, it, it's just that like now that the Broncos added Josh Reynolds to the mix, like uh, the Broncos will now have the opportunity where you will now have in this particular scenario, you will have not just Mims, but you'll have Corley who are space creators, right? People that you can work in many different ways. And, you know, I, th I, 
it, it sounds very obnoxious to kind of compare him to, you know, Debo Samuel, but like, you know, he is an appropriate comparison for a Debo Samuel. And I think that actually another fun one is kind of a blast from the past of a player that we, we all wish would have worked out, but Carlos Henderson, like Carlos yeah. Henderson um, would have been a very, very fun, you know, prospect for a guy like a Sean Payton, uh, you know, certainly to work with, unfortunately it didn't work out with all of his off the field issues, but uh, so Malachi Corley is in the mix and now at pick 121. I feel like this is now roughly where we probably could go uh, maybe defense here. Like, yep, so this might be an opportunity to fill like edge, interior, D line, corner. Yeah. So, as far as the top edge player, um, it looks like you're going at maybe a Xavier Thomas right now, uh, Chris Abrams Drain. Um, we have the defensive lineman from uh, Miami, from the U, Leonard Taylor. Elijah Jones, a very athletic corner from Boston College. And we know that uh, um, the Broncos recently had had success with uh, going defense at Boston College. Mm-hmm. Um, you have, uh, I'm going to butcher that last name, but you have uh, 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 Justin. Um, Justin Edible. Yeah, uh, edible. Justin Edible. We'll just go with that one. He'll fit uh, in perfectly in Colorado. Justin Adam. Get in my belly. Muhammad Kamara. <laughs> Is this too yes. early to draft Kamara, you think? I mean, I you think he'll still be around in 136? I don't think so. I think that I think that Kamara I I love the I think it's easy to compare him to Shaquille Barrett, but I also think it's a right comparison though. Mm-hmm. Um but like, here's the thing: is like, I actually think coming out, Kamara might actually be a better prospect than Barrett was coming out, and so I think that that's why there's so much buzz for him, you know. And he he plays exactly the same. He's relentless. He's, you know, he can basically get to the quarterback, you know, almost at will, you know, just by you know being a free rusher. And I think that like using him strictly as a pass rush specialist, like early on you know, would really do him well. So I wouldn't mind taking a, a, a chance on a Kamara, you know. I have um, a proposal. Maybe yeah. we take like a Chris Abrams drain here and we've got 145, 147, 136. We could maybe trade up and get Kamara as well. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, and we actually, do uh, we do have a trade interested team, I should say, with the Colts for 151. <laughs> What are they offering? So this is where we create the offer. Okay. All of them. <laughs> so uh, so we could trade or we could wait till maybe 136 and maybe take a take a guy, right? Let's do that. Let's make a selection here and then and then look at a possible trade at 136 or the with 145, 147. So do we go, so then here's the thing is if we do go Kamara is that the route we go? It's just at risk of maybe losing him at pick one thirty six. Maybe we slow down the mock here if we if it's possible to and go one by one and see if he falls down the board a little bit, and then we can maybe come up if we want to. Yeah, um, I like that. All right, uh, so I think we take the edge. So 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 Gage, you want corner right here, and then try to sneak up to get Kamara at edge. Or we could do it the other way around. We could do edge here, and we could come up to get a corner. Well, the corner drain, drain was further up on the prospect list or on the on the ranking list. We yeah. had to go down for Kamara really a little like, bit. I, mean, I really it's, like Abrams Drain a lot. Yeah. I think he could be really versatile as both a boundary guy and a nickel guy. They also have, uh, as far as other corners, just if you guys were Kamal Hayden, another one, uh, Smith Wade, Kalen Carson, Kalen King. I do like Smith Wade as well. I haven't really done much on Elijah Jones. You say he's really athletic. I that's a trait I definitely like. Yeah. So it's up to you guys. This might be uh, a little bit for my blood for Nehemiah Pritchett. Yeah. I, I'm, no, I think I think Abrams drain. Yeah. So I, um, I'm kind of leaning uh, maybe to edge, but yeah, I like doing something different too. Uh, let's go. 
Let's go Chris Abrams drain. And then um, let's see if I can find, uh, we'll find a way to see if we can pause the draft. There we go. Yeah, do it, man. He's gone. Elijah Jones. He's fallen. Oh, see. Oh, see. I was, I was worried about Kamara with the uh, Bucks, actually. Minnesota, maybe? He, he oh, went, he, he, damn it. He went to um, bu Buffalo's a good spot for him. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Cam. No, you're good. It's the risk. You, that's the crapshoot that you, <laughs> that you, you run into with, uh, with these kinds of things. We'll have to see what else is available on the edge. Here we go. Oh, well, guess who just fell out? Xavier, Xavier Thomas. <laughs> yeah, Xavier Thomas, maybe the 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 top player uh, with pick one eleven. Um, I, I obviously uh, it, this is a a wild card here, uh, but one thing I was going to throw out is you know a position that obviously George Payton, <laughs> George Payton and Sean Payton certainly yeah. do value. And that would oh, be there's your Garendo. and Mr. Dylan Lowby. Oh, there's my guy. Yeah. So we, uh, so maybe to humor Glenn, maybe, maybe we hold off on going, uh, running back and we, uh, we, we see if we well, can but I, Lowby I still think he's, I, st I think Lowby will be there when we get to, I think so too. Yeah. yeah that's we, only, we, we only, we only need nine kicks. Luke McCaffrey either. Luke McCaffrey, for those wondering, um, is I think he's like the like 180, yeah, 182. Okay. I think that 145, 147 area could be a real sweet spot there to get a running back. I think yeah. so. And tight end too. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I know, I know who you're thinking for tight end too, Cam. Yeah. I won't I won't spoil it, but I, I yeah. have a, a hunch. Yeah, there's there's two of them there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know Xavier Thomas. Let's do it, man. That's a, he fell right in our lap. Yeah, love it. And what's what's really uh what's really cool is um, and we Brando's gone. There's probably a way that I think you can mm. do it. Uh, Braylon Allen went to Washington. That's a fun fit. There's some good players coming off the board right now. Christian Boyd, I really like him. Me, yeah, so uh, there's definitely uh, maybe Jordan Travis to Atlanta. Interesting. That's interesting. That's a good project for them. All right, here we go. Let's check maybe running back. Tight Let's end. do it. So tight end, we have Ben Sanat, uh and Theo Johnson. Oh, actually, a lot of people really feel like Ben Sanat could slide into day two. So getting him in round five, you know, could in essence be a steal. Um, obviously Theo is the freak. Uh, people have kind of compared him a little bit to, uh, Jimmy Graham. There's Dalen Holker, uh, for tight end. Uh, as far as running back, cause we talked about running back. There is Dylan Lowby. There he is. So if we took Lowby here, we'd still be guaranteed one of those top two tight ends. Or because there's only one. Or, or Luke McCaffrey. Or Luke McCaffrey. Oof. Personally, Ooh. I would go with probably Lauby and McCaffrey. That's a good one. Oh, kind of yeah. what I was thinking. And the only thing we have to really worry about here is the Tennessee Titans. So I think that could be a pretty safe look. Oh, that would be fun. What order do we or want to do it? Do you think we could take 203 and 207 and trade back up to get Lauby or McCaffrey? No, I doubt it. I, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, it's absolute. I think McCaffrey. Yeah. Let's do Lowby here and then McCaffrey at 147. The likelihood that the next pick would be McCaffrey is. So uh, let me. Of course, me, uh, saying that guar virtually guarantees that he will be picked 147. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so I, I, I am curious. So obviously we are running um, a, a simulation obviously with this Glenn, but like for Dylan Lobby, where, where in your estimation do you feel like a, a guy like a Dylan Lobby um, could land? So where he is valuable is the guy is a truly, truly a complete player. He's 
extremely fast. He had some of the fastest times at the Senior Bowl. He's officially a running back, but he could line up in a wide receiver position and just blaze down the field. He's very elusive. He's an excellent blocker out of the backfield. I mean, there's so many different opportunities and plays that could be that could be drawn up with him in mind. Um, you know, granted, he he was not, you know, playing the top tier schools, um, playing for the University of New Hampshire, which uh, is is my alma mater. But I mean, this guy is the real deal. In the game one of this season, he had 295 yards receiving as a running back. I mean, I think the guy is a an absolute talent and will be a, a real versatile steal for somebody in this draft. You know, and um, can really fill the Joker role in this offense. Yeah, you know, and and it's it's not a it's not necessarily not even a a knock on him per se, but it's like I think that's one of the the, the fascinating conversations that's going to be fun with this class, this running back class, because it really feels like there are a handful. Even if it's not a very, very deep running back class, it seems like there's a lot of backs in this class that Sean Payton could work with. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, we, we recently just had, uh, what is it, in day two, Jalen Wright there, uh, you know, sitting there. And obviously, it seems the Broncos had a top 30 visit in real life uh, scheduled with him, with Jalen Wright. So, uh, you know, they clearly uh, will maybe value running back maybe a little bit higher so maybe they go out and if they do out they if they do go get a, a Bo Nix right you know that maybe you're you're talking about maybe pairing him in kind of a, a reverse sen a scenario where you know you're not necessarily pairing him with a wide receiver but you're pairing him with a running back right so like mm -hmm. you know maybe like you know like we just did we recently just did JJ McCarthy so maybe pairing him with like a Blake Corum or you know, or, or even, you know, going out and getting a Bucky Irving if you did, you know, Bo Nix. So I, I think that the camaraderie would be big, but, you know, those are some other names. And Trey Benson, right? Uh, Trey Benson is the is another, uh, you know, famous one. So I, I think there's definitely a lot of uh, cases to be made for not just Lauby, but I think it would say, I think it would say a lot, though, for, you know, Peyton and what he would value for a guy like Lauby, because I think that he does, you know, I think it's really easy to fall in love with some of those other guys, but he has three down back potential. Like that's the thing that is so fascinating with him. So, all right. So now we will finally accomplish something that should have been done in 2017. <laughs> and that means that a McCaffrey will finally be drafted. I'm just saying like, you don't think Luke McCaffrey was going to hang out there a little bit longer. <laughs> like when we could have taken our seventh rounders and moved up back up. I I don't like think so. 30 spots. I mean Taj Washington's oh there's here comes a run of wide receivers right here. Okay, never mind. Oh, Theo Johnson gone. gone. Yeah. No, do Michael we throw Perry, it? I like him, Michigan guy. Oh, there goes Ben Sinnott. Oh, there goes uh, Hulker went to Hulker. Hulker. Mm, Makai Wingo, the one who uh, was recruited yeah, by Jamar Kane. All right, so it looks like our tight end strategy is to pray that Greg Dulcich can <laughs> stay in a game. <laughs> or develop <laughs> Lucas Kroll, right? That, that, that is not out of the realm of possibility, Cam. No. Yeah, Lucas Kroll would have gone he's right got here. Some good potential. I think he would have been gone sooner that, than that, Mike. There's another one, Jaheim Bell. So I'm actually kind of slightly surprised we haven't addressed tackle. Um, Zach Zenter just went off the board. He's somebody who would have gone a lot higher if he didn't. There's get Drake. Oh, of course, Drake Nugent, Colorado boy, got oh, drafted man. by the there goes Chiefs. My guy Pritchett. Dylan yeah, Johnson. so we so so in this draft we had Rosengarten going to the Raiders and uh, Drake <laughs> going to the Chiefs. Oh man, I wonder how they would feel. <laughs> oh, that'd be wow, awkward. that's incredible value. Tracy was like the 110th best back or, or player overall in the draft, and he went to the Patriots at 180. Joe Milton. Oh, there. Joe Milton. All Miami. Things. That's a pretty good backup for. It's, a, it's an interesting. Tua. Fit. Yeah, Marcus Harris. I like him out of Auburn. There's Kamal Hayden. 
what position are you guys kind of feeling about rounding out, you know, here? You guys may be thinking maybe a developmental throw a dart, uh, developmental maybe tackle or, you know, maybe even uh, another corner maybe or – Edge, D line, tackle. I mean, really see what's available. See what they got left when they get there. Because all those are all good pieces to grab, like developmental guys at this point in the draft, and just throw those darts. Hell, I wouldn't even be opposed to trading down here and just acquiring some more picks if we could. Or maybe uh, sneak away where we can, you know, throw a seventh rounder at some tip Ryman. <laughs> There, he's uh, he's an interesting one, and especially given uh, you know uh, maybe an Illinois connection with uh, with Jim Leonard. Scroll down. So Hunter Norzad. If my uh, if if we go with Ryman, Mike's gonna say just the tip, for sure. <laughs> Why do you gotta steal my jokes? <laughs> you didn't even let me say it. Oh, Frank <laughs> Frank Boy, Jr. Jr. Julian Pearl. Okay. And Julian Frank Pearl. Gore Jr. Tanner. Uh, oh, Jason McClellan. Omar Brown from Omar the Brown. University of Nebraska. I wasn't going to go that far. I was just saying Omar. I know. Brown. I have heard Brett Coleman kind of rave about Corker. Yeah. So uh, that could be a developmental tackle option. Uh, there's I also feel like we should reward Cam. <laughs> for administrating the Ooh, uh, the, the mock draft party. tonight by letting him pick a, a, a corn husker. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I did, Ooh. I did have us take Dylan Lowby, you know. To <laughs> that is fair. Yeah. Hey, go down to the last one again. Which one? Keep scrolling. Miles Harden, right there. Also, Trey Taylor. You know what's crazy is Trey Taylor had such a su- successful award-winning season yeah and every mock that that i see that he's picked the the choice is like a d or an f it's even if in the seventh round it's just bizarre that he's well, gonna... is, those three are interesting so miles harden trey taylor and isaiah davis i like those three trey i mean and if you're gonna go off of local i, I mean, mean not tra- right now but within the, our next two picks well, we would have to go with a pick here because we have pick 203 and then our last one at 207. Because Trey, I think, would be uh, – he should have gone way before this. but Oh, yeah. You know. Uh, Isaiah is Davis it, is kind of like a uh, – he, he's almost like a McLaughlin, really. Is, is Trey's McLaughlin? availability in, in question, is that why – uh, are they wondering if he's going to be eligible to? I to- wonder. No, I, I definitely wonder because, like, I mean, he won the what was it, the gym? Why wouldn't he be? Uh, so, I mean, why wouldn't he be available? Well, because like when there is Air Force commitment. Yeah, the Air Force yeah, commitment. That's they they can waive that now. Sure, but like, uh, there's still not necessarily a guarantee, and and maybe it's also too maybe just the overall evaluation if, if he's. Possible. Right. If if he's drafted, he he has the option to waive his his service. I don't know. These these ta- this this looks like a lot of solid tackles here. How's Glaze? Glaze is really versatile. Um if you actually select on him here, so he's um it says that he's played left tackle, but I he if you go look at in twenty twenty two and twenty twenty one he played both right tackle and, you know, some left tackle. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't be, you know, we would definitely be very bad grade, but, you know, who cares about a grade? I would not mind, you know, taking versatility over, you know, something like that. And so I would not mind Glaze. Um, there's another Michigan tackle, Carson Barnhart. Sean Payton, if we know one thing, he does enjoy versatility on his offensive line. So yeah. that could be an argument for a guy like Glaze or possibly in this scenario, a guy like Barnhart as well. Yeah, because Barnhart, as we can see, like he's played left tackle in 2023 for like almost 200 snaps, right guard for 200 snaps, and right tackle for, you know, nearly 450 snaps. And this could be maybe like your one, two year development project as a long term mm-hmm. placement for either Bulls or McGlinchey. And this would be as crazy as it is. Um, 
if we if we were to take Barnhart, you guys go with that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this would be the first time the Denver Broncos selected a tackle since Garrett Bowles. That is shocking. And we steal a Michigan guy away from Jim Harbaugh, which is another win. <laughs> <laughs> we could still take just the tip, Ryman. <laughs> Honestly, I, need a I tight think we right take now. Taylor. I, I am just so shocked. The other uh, position I was kind of looking at, and I'm sure you guys have seen in my mock drafts of center, just to do like a center competition this late. How's Bordellini? What do you know about him? Ver, uh, you know, he's, uh, I want to say he was really stout in 2021. He's a, I'd say he, he's, please play some left guard, play some right guard. He played nothing but center, um, you know, Wisconsin. And we know that Wisconsin has always had a, you know, a rather good offensive line. So I, I really like him. Um, but I also don't hate the idea of, you know, going for a guy like Trey Taylor. Like I, I really don't. What if what if we do Frank Gore Jr. running back? We already did a running back. I don't care. Mm-hmm. But I think he I think Gore Jr. is really projected to be an uh, undrafted free agent signing. Yeah. For some team. <clears throat> you know, if we don't take Bortolini, man, the Dallas Cowboys probably will. <laughs> <laughs> they sure love their Wisconsin centers, man. Travis Frederick, Tyler Biotis. <laughs> it's true. How funny would that be? I mean, if we don't take him, we gotta, we gotta just, we gotta pay attention to where we're going. Right, 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 right. I'm still in on Trey Taylor. I'm good on Trey Taylor too. I like, I like Taylor. Well, and like, so the the thing I've been thinking about is like, even with the loss of. Justin and even with the, the the signing of um you know Brandon Jones and re-signing of PJ Locke. There I'm it's a tip. <laughs> and Gore yep. goes to the Eagles. Eagles. Gore goes to the Eagles. <laughs> tip is a ram. Um I I'm really curious about ah I, I'm really curious about the safety position and what the Broncos are gonna do. All right, here comes I, Dallas. Oh, nope. all right. Josh Wallace. <laughs> there goes Jason McClellan. Julian Pearl of Baltimore. Those are some good players, man. Oh, he wants oh, to be he back. To hey, guys, want to be back. Stays home. Oh, that's perfect. like it. Omar Brown went to Washington. Wow. That actually is a good fifth room in Dan Quinn. Mm hmm. Whittington. The Mr. Reliable with Texas. Brandon Coleman to the Titans. I don't know why, but Trent Jones actually going to Baltimore and the Chargers actually feels appropriate. <laughs> there's Keith Randolph. There's there's Dallas again. Isaiah Davis. <laughs> Trevin Wallace, Seahawks. We actually uh, met with Trevin. Ooh. When? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they met with Trevin. Uh, I want to. Was he at the East West Shrine Bowl or something? Like, I think they there was some news that came out that the Broncos had an in a sit down interview with Trevin. Okay. Ooh. Same thing with Jordan McGee too. Okay, so this might be a area that they might want to address linebacker. Trey Knox going to the Bucks. Holy Cross getting drafted. CJ Hansen to Buffalo. God, when was the last time a Holy Cross player came into the NFL? Khalif Raymond? Maybe. Wasn't he on a receiver from Holy Cross Steve, that Steve Smith Sr. absolutely loves? What is his name? Yeah. <clears throat> Analyzing. All right, let's see what our grade is. Oh, oh! You got JJ at twelve. We did. Yeah, dude. Look at our oh. look at our round fives. He <clears throat> just fell. We killed it. Yeah. <laughs> the funny. The, this is what is funny. It looks like my report card. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, this is what is funny. They hate. Lowby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and McCaffrey. And McCaffrey. 
Like they, 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 they hate McCaffrey. Barnhart got a D minus. <laughs> How? A Michigan tackle in the sixth round at the two hundreds gets a D minus. That's, That's crazy. Funny. But you know, I mean, how did you get JJ McCarthy? <laughs> <laughs> There's no way he falls to twelve. I mean, it is it is always possible. It, it is always possible. You know. Yep. Um, I, I, I was wondering what you were going to do. Was. I was going to flip my table if I saw like a Bo Nix. <laughs> <laughs> But that, we were going to trade down if McCarthy didn't fall. Yeah, we were actually planning to trade down. And then we kind of queued it all up and then found out that McCar- uh, McCarthy was there. And it's like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I was waiting to see like Cam trade up to two and go get Penix. Like, let's no, 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 no. See, I would have to trade uh, <laughs> Pat Sertan for picks four and 27, keep pick 12, and then trade up and get Penix at four then draft a running back at 12 and then draft a corner uh, at, uh, at pick 27, you know, cause I wanted to drink the Kool-Aid. Right. Could you so if anyone wants to KG throw in the chat, what do you think the grade should be? Feel free. Yeah. Could you I mean, imagine right. McCarthy falling to 12? That would be a dream scenario. I can still see it though. Cause like, I, I mean, I, as I was saying like earlier, it's like it all just hinges on the giants at that point for me. So like, say, and, and what, what I'm saying is like, so say there's not a run on what people have been projecting, which is one, two, three, and four, right? Say that doesn't happen. Well, then you are looking at the Giants as like an ideal spot, which is like, if they don't take a quarterback here, Denver or Minnesota will be in a bidding war for JJ McCarthy or even Drake May if they slide. Like if the McCarthy stuff is is true, uh, that, you know, he goes, say, like a pick three or, you know, two or whatever, you know, and Jaden goes pick three. Like that just means that, you know, May is going to end up sliding. And so, you know, and that's when it gets tricky because I could see a team like the Giants and Brian Dable fall in love with a guy like Drake May because of what he had in Josh Allen. So I could see him falling in love with a Drake May. And, you know, so it's just you're you're talking about such a bidding war at that point. So. I'm looking at it just from the simple point of like pick six and you know what the Broncos are going to do. And so like if it gets pe- if it gets past six and there is a quarterback that is within reach, I am doing everything that I can to trade up. And so in that situation, and what's great at least in that situation is you're not talking about trading Pat Sertan in that situation. You're talking about trading with Tennessee and tr- and lumping Cortland Sutton into a possible deal and trading up. Because Tennessee needs a wide receiver, you know, and but they can. To be fair, Pastor Tan is not getting traded. Anywhere. No, he's not at all. He's not at all. The, the The only way you ever do that is if you go into the top two or three, if you no. ever. So, but I, I it, but, honestly, you know, it, if we were, let's say we were going to move to up with Arizona, right? Before that, I think you go first this year, first next year, um, probably like a three and a five in Cortland Sutton. I think is what it's going to take. Might take a two next year as well, but yeah. yeah, Sertan is not a part of any trade. That, that I mean, I, I I don't think he's traded at all, but I I just feel like in order for you to truly get that quarterback, if you will, you're gonna have to have a very hard conversation, you know, uh, about you know dangling the the Sertan idea, you know. And, 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 and the thing is like, it's uh it's got nothing to do with us even hating Pat Sertan, you know, or anything like that. It's like, he is just so valuable. The reason why we're having that conversation is like, it's to get you the quarterback. Like, it's just like, it's got nothing to do with us. Like even hating, you know, him as a player or anything like mm-hmm. that. The only way you're trading Pat Sertan is if you're getting your franchise quarterback, that's right. the only trade off yeah. here. Yeah. So Big E, I should let you know Joe Milton went to the Dolphins. I know he's one of your yeah. favorite uh, mock draft and guys. Early too. I didn't think he'd go that early. He did go the early. Michael Penix went to the Saints, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That'd be I, I, I think that, I think Michael Penix Jr. is going to have a phenomenal career. I I I, I really believe he's going to be successful in the NFL it, through no just just a vibe. You know, just a feeling. Uh, I think he's he's a distance from these injuries. 
he throws the ball like nobody I, I can remember with. I mean, it's almost not like on a clothesline. It's just, I think the guy's really going to do well. Um, it's just, he's such a wild card for me. Right. With, that's with, 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 with Sean, because it's like, because I mean, again, I, I don't know about you guys, but like, I and mean, you don't really put too much stock into pro days, but I think the one thing that he did was he surprised a lot of people with this, with his athleticism. And if there truth, if there truthfully is a takeaway from his pro day, it was how does a guy with multiple surgeries and multiple injuries, Get down. Uh, you know, run a four, four, six or four, four, five, you know, and, a, you know, above 35 inch vertical, you know, and then also a 10, six broad jump, you know? Okay. So, I mean, like, so, I mean, like it's, he put up absurd numbers. And so like, and, and two, like, I also think that him being a, being at Washington and then making him a pure pocket passer, you know, like is, is appealing for a guy like Sean. And so like when you, when you kind of mix in and when you kind of mix a little bit to this idea that, you know, he can get out of the the pocket with that athleticism, like you can teach that, like you can actually teach him and, and mold him in a way like, okay, this is when you need to escape the pocket. This is when you need to escape pressure. You know um, the question just really just is going to remain is our team's going to be really, really scared off with him and no. those injuries. Exactly. Right. You know, and so I think that that's why at the end of the day, my 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 running joke at this point I, is I think if you were to predict who the Broncos quarterback would be, is that he'll have Nicks, he'll have Nicks in his name. You know, is that he will have Nicks in his name, whether that be Michael Penix or Bo Nix. I think that like it, it, it seems like at this point the Broncos' next quarterback will have Nicks in his name. Absolute Gage, I was, <laughs> I was I was fully expecting to hear. You know, so <laughs> it was it's right here's some angry cat in the in the background there. You know, you were talking about the pro day, and usually that's a slam dunk, but it sounds like the Drake uh, Drake May pro day did not necessarily go as well as he probably would have hoped. And it sounds like a lot of people uh, in you know that are critiquing these players are suggesting that he is not necessarily showing some of the skills of a, of a top 10 draft pick, but um, I, I find it hard to believe that he would ever drop to that, to that degree. But what do you guys yeah. think? The last time I remember seeing a pro day really tank a quarterback stock is Teddy Bridgewater. Mm. And that he said himself, it's because he didn't wear his gloves for his pro day. <laughs> and just never got used to not throwing with gloves. But I mean, I don't know, man. I just feel like at this point, the tape speaks for itself with a guy like Drake May. There's a reason right. why throughout yeah. the entire initial part of the offseason, he was viewed as the consensus number two quarterback. Or Q QB two, if you will, 1B, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that in terms of a fit perspective, Jaden Daniels better fits the Washington Commanders at number two overall. And the New England Patriots are in a unique situation where I feel like it'd be more beneficial for them to just come down – or take Marvin Harrison and just try to build some of the, the assets that they need to build on that roster. That's where I feel like Minnesota could then come up and get their guy. I think it's Drake because of those Josh McCown connections. And yeah. if that's the case, you have a chance to get somebody like a JJ McCarthy here. Yeah. I don't see why all of these narratives and rumors have come out about Drake may because it just doesn't make sense why somebody whose tape mm -hmm. speaks for itself, he's been the consensus 1A quarterback, and just has this dramatic fall like that just doesn't seem precedent to me. Yeah, and I think that that's what Great. makes the, the the conversation of what quarterback falls in love with, you know, Sean Payton, or, what, or vice versa, what quarterback does Sean Payton fall in love with, you know, this year. And I think that, you know, it's going to be really interesting because, like, you know, I think Sayer mentioned it and I even mentioned it last week. It's like we 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 also can't get like so tied up onto this whole Drew Brees archetype, you know, uh for, for Sean. We at least have to keep an open mind about like who Sean Payton likes and who he could potentially love. So I mean like and I think that that's why a Drake May is so fun because if that opportunity presents itself, which I mean crazier things have happened in the NFL draft. 
Do we expect mm-hmm. it to happen? You know, with 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 made a slide necessarily? No. I mean, if anything, he slides past four, and the Vikings trade up for him. You know, but uh, like I, he's so fun because you can definitely see the processing, you can see the athleticism, you can see the strong arm. Like, you know, it's definitely a blend of, you know, if you're really going off of high, high ceilings, like it's almost look, like you're looking at a, a blend of a Josh Allen and a Justin Herbert. Like, it's just like a, the blend of both of those guys. And he's so fun. And especially when you factor in that, you know, Peyton really loved Mahomes. Like in that draft that he, you know, that Mahomes was in, he loved Patrick Mahomes and he wanted Patrick Mahomes really, really bad that draft. So it is certainly possible that May is in the cards. And I think that, you know, to what Gage said, it's like that's that's the reason why the Giants pick for me is like the pick I'm looking at right now. Because it's like if they if they don't go quarterback, and it's true, and let me let me clarify that they will address quarterback in this in this draft more than likely. I just don't think it's gonna I just don't think it could be at like six, right? Like uh, so I mean Hartman in the seven. Please please. Well, you know how Mike was talking about the the ESPN uh, Mike Clay report, uh, you know, ranking the the worst rosters. The Giants actually were ranked as the worst roster. So, would taking a quarterback at that pick, when you have all these other needs, and you actually have a guy on the roster that's making over forty million dollars this year at QB, is that the smartest choice at that point? I don't think so. And and so that that could be a situation where an, another spot it may, is made available for the Broncos to uh, to not have to worry about that team taking quarterback. Plus, we got to remember the Giants already have a franchise quarterback on their roster, Drew Locke, baby. That's true. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yep. and, and Drew is, Locke. And there is like a a noteworthy news item that like you know. If it's true, if it's true that the or if it comes to fruition that the Giants do not take a quarterback, then the news report that came out is true. And the fact that you know, w- had the Giants signed Russell Wilson, that he was never going to be guaranteed the starting job there with the Giants, and that Daniel Jones was going to be the starter there in New York. Do I believe that report? I don't know, but if that is true, that lends you to believe they will pass on a quarterback at you know, at six and that they, you know, they feel somewhat comfortable, you know, with, with, with taking a guy like that. So um, I, I just, uh, I really just kind of come back to like, you know, it, and you know, Mike, you and I had this conversation even before we hit record, but it's like, that's the yeah. rough, that's the rough conversation. I think the Broncos fans are having is, you know, do you call it a safe route? you know, uh, for Bo Nix at pick 12, you know, and, you know, or, or do you trade back and you assure yourself of more capital and, and, and take Bo Nix there. And I think that what makes Bo Nix so fascinating is he, he truly actually feels like the Drew Brees archetype. And that's why so many people have, you know, compared him, if you will, to the, the, the Drew Brees, you know, type of style, like, and, and he actually may have a little bit more mobility to him. And I think what's so funny is, I actually compared him to Brock Purdy. And if you actually read what was being said about Brock Purdy after the Super Bowl from Steve Spagnolo and some of those coaches, is that they said he reminded he reminded a lot of us of what Drew Brees was, you know, offering in the league. And so I think that like that kind of style, that kind of you know, play, I, I'm really I I really am. That that is a great video. If you guys actually have not had a chance to see that to what Biggie is referring to, Kurt Warner recently just did a a video that was uploaded on uh, the NFL channel on YouTube. Like it's a great video. Like he makes great decisions. And I know uh, Glenn, you got a chance to see the, the interview. I think Mm -hmm. I shared it on Twitter, but like him, even on Colin Coward, like he's just a very authentic and likable guy, you know? And, so like it's really understandable why a guy like Sean, again, not to throw the whole archetype into it, but like it would be understandable why a guy like Sean would love a guy like that. And it's funny because he is like he's almost like as a, even as a rookie, he'd be the an adult in the room, you know, so to speak. It, it just a tremendous amount of starts in in his collegiate career, 
incredible accuracy, well over 70%. You know, five different offensive coordinators <clears throat> in his time. Um, so he's he's obviously smart where he's able to pick up different off different offenses. Like even the fact that he's that he's married at that age, which I had no idea until that Colin Coward interview. Right. I'm like, this guy, like there's everything about this guy s s seems like a 28 or 30 year old person, you know, and and he's uh, what, 24? Um, 23, I don't know. He's an intriguing prospect, but I think 12 is is a reach. You know, I look at the Raiders and and there's talk about them going for quarterback, but I could really picture them trying to draft maybe a, a, a strong edge rusher that they could pair with a Wilkins and a Max Crosby and just wreak complete havoc um, yeah. on, the, on the defensive side. I, that's just where I think that they're probably going to go. I don't see them going for quarterback in the first. Plus, it's been documented. They do really like Ethan <clears throat> O'Connell, and they've got Minshew mm -hmm. in that building. Yeah. Quarterback isn't a dire pressing need for the Raiders right now. They may want to elect to bolster their roster, and I I, could, I wouldn't blame them, honestly. But when it comes to Bo Nix at 12, it just seems at this point like the Broncos are going to be able to get it a little bit later on, trade yes. down, get more draft capital, and then just hope that somebody like the Raiders doesn't fall in love with them or just somebody else that <laughs> – just doesn't fall in love with them. And then at that point, you'll be like, okay, we can we can go there, we can get Bo Nix, and we can feel confident about taking him a little bit closer to the 20s, maybe even closer to 30 than at 12, which just feels like it's a reach. Yeah. Gage, Gage, where do you think we could trade down to or Cam, like if you want to chime in too, you know, how far back would we need to trade in the first round in order to get a second round pick in this draft, do you think? Man, um, hmm. I, I, I don't know. Maybe if we came down with like the Rams at nineteen, so yeah. not that far back. No, I don't think so. I would it's say just, early twenties, though. I mean, maybe an ideal spot. I mean, because well, well I, I, unless unless you got Dallas, who didn't make any free agent moves and wants to move up from twenty four. Yeah, well, and I think that you know. The hard part would be you have to run through like and, and executives do this. Peyton has George Payton has mentioned this numerous times. That's why they run these mock drafts so that like they know the scenarios in their head and mm -hmm. you know they, they play these types of scenarios so that they know you know what to expect. But like if you and that and that's why like when I was prefacing it, you know, even you know on the show, like I want to say a couple weeks ago, like if there is a class that you could probably work in trading back and still take your guy at quarterback, this is like that one class where you could probably make it work. The unfortunate thing with that is you just better pray that a team like the Los Angeles Rams, you know, don't want to go for a Bo Nix because, you know, we know that Stafford's getting up there in age and they may want to, you know, go out there and, and take the quarterback. And let's just say, let's just say that the Vikings report that came out today is true. They don't take a quarterback at pick 11 and they don't even trade up at pick 11. Right. And that they actually, you know, think about, you know, maybe punting if you will, and letting, you know, Sam Darnold ride in 2024 and go for 2025. They probably could take a quarterback at 23. And that, and that in essence could end up being Bo Nix. Right. And so I, I just think that like, you just kind of put – that's the unfortunate thing with taking Bonex at 12 is like, you know, do you kind of pigeonhole yourself a little bit? But, like, I like the idea with the Broncos coming out, Peyton and Sean coming out and saying that, like, we love the idea of six or seven quarterbacks in this class. And I think that that's why the possibility is of like, okay, well, if they trade back, maybe they go a different position, then they go out and they get, like, a Spencer Rattler, you know, Michael Pratt, you know, like some Sam of those Hartman. guys. No, dude. <laughs> I just feel like if they did go that route, a lot of members of this fan base would check out. I really do, man. He's talking about Hartman, by the way, not. Oh no, I'm talking. I'm talking Pratt. I'm talking. I'm talking pretty much anybody outside of right. the top six. No, Even no. Rattler would kind of be like, man. Rattler actually may be worse. Really? Yeah. Joe Milton. I, well, listen. Rattler at least has this sort of ceiling to him that makes him intriguing. 
He's got the talent. It's just, oh man, not getting a quarterback in this draft of the caliber, even of a Michael Penix Jr. would just be devastating for this. So team. I agree. So let me ask you guys this question, because obviously it, it had been floated around so much. What is more enticing for you? Is it the Dak Prescott idea and punting and, you know, throwing all your eggs into that basket for 2025, you know, or is it going out and getting the quarterback, you know, this year in 2024? I want Tannehill and Dak. Mm. I like Dak's regular season play, but in the brightest moments, he shrivels. And I just cannot have that, man. He has just consistently come up short when he's needed the most. That's who Dak Prescott is as a player at this point in his career. And think about this. Dak Prescott would be the same age at that point than that Russell Wilson was when we made that trade. The Broncos have been there. The Broncos have done that. They cannot diddle-daddle and fool themselves around anymore with this. This could seriously be a move that sets this franchise back another five years. No, yeah. no, no, <laughs> no. And forget even for, for, yeah. forgetting yeah, if it's if it's Dak. You know, like there are so many different variables that if you're putting your eggs into one player mm -hmm. a year down the road, <clears throat> is just so improbable and impossible, really to make that a reality i mean there's just like, everything would need to fall into place for that to happen and i just think that it would be complete malpractice to to punt on this season and in hopes of getting one particular player next year you know, think back to the mitch trubisky to sean watson draft yeah the 49ers punted on a quarterback that year because they thought that following off season they were going to get kirk cousins and who do they get out of that <laughs> they got jimmy garoppolo yeah, or yeah. I was gonna say, didn't they draft? Or there was the one draft. Oh, I, that I, was Solomon Thomas that year. But I was thinking, um, there was one draft like that, and I it may have been the twenty. No, it, it was the twenty twenty draft where they took Brock Purdy. Like they weren't, and they weren't intending. No, Purdy was after that. He's he's only Purdy been in the league. This I was, yeah. was twenty two. Yeah, but yeah, like they were intending to to not take a quarterback in that, and they took the last pick of the draft, and they took Brock Purdy, and rest is history like it's just like so what about you mike i mean talk about bailing out a disastrous trade last pick of the draft like, mike mike like this is just like it's so it's so awful like that guy does not belong wow. on any football field that that you know just at this point is it's just pathetic i mean even at the combine it was you go with those two i'm telling you right now they're going to walk into the stadium to sexy back <laughs> Denver Broncos uh, Super Bowl champions 2025. Yeah, <laughs> with Shadur Sanders as the uh, as our just, quarterback at that point. What well, and and even for me, it's like if you're punting, I don't even know what another losing season will do. Because like, especially for the ownership group and the the pride that they that that they even have, I don't know if they could even handle another losing season. Because then you're talking about the moment you have a losing season is you're going to be putting Sean Payton on a very sizzling hot seat, you know, for 2025 and then taking a quarterback, you know, forced, if you will, to take a quarterback in 2025. And like, and so it's just, it's really hard for me to see the idea of Sean and especially, and we, we said it before, and especially in such a deep, deep quarterback class, for them to just punt on an, on a quarterback altogether, like it's just it's just asinine for me to possibly even think that you know. Uh, I, I I agree, Cam. I mean, I think there's zero chance that that happens. I think, and I believe the gauge hit the nail on the head. This fan base, you know, for the Super Bowl Fifty is so far behind us, and these horrible years that have ensued, you know, and the excitement of getting the the new ownership with the deep pockets, you know what? We can have fancy new uniforms. We can have, you know, renovations to the stadium. You know, you can have, um, you know, a fancy headquarters. Um, but ticket prices are going up big time. And the fact that you're then, um, you know, not 
getting a quarterback and giving this this fan base a, a chance to be excited yeah. is uh, would be a terrible mistake. I, I don't yeah. think people would stand for it. We'd see a lot of empty seats at Mile High, man. We really would, and I'll take it because that means cheap, cheaper tickets for me. But <laughs> at the end of the day, man, this fan base is what drives this whole team, and ownership knows that. Yeah, they're the ones who are filling the pockets. At the end of the day, they have to sell this product on the field to the fan base. And if you're going out there with Jarrett Stidham and Sorry to pick on you, Michael Pratt, but I'm just using you as an example. Michael Pratt, this team would just immediately lose almost all interest. At least the last thing that last team that I can take think of where the front office was blatantly tanking was the 2019 Miami Dolphins when they were just blatantly mm-hmm. tanking. And, and even and- then, they had Brian Fitzpatrick and Josh Rosen on the roster. They at least had an excitement factor there with Rosen training for him, a former first round pick. They had that excitement factor there. And then you had Fitz magic on top of that, who provided a lot of really fun moments throughout that season. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jarrett Sidham and Michael Pratt ain't providing that dog. You uh, just can't. Well, Danucci. <laughs> Danucci. No. Yeah. I, I, I was going to, I was going to tell do- me DeVito is available. Yeah, I, I I was gonna make it even you know worse. I know you know Mike was joking and you know throwing Tannehill, but I, like you said I, go, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> but like to go stuff wor- like to to go worse, it's like, like not Michael Pratt, but just to have a room of Ben DiNucci, Jarrett Stidham, and Ryan Tannehill in twenty twenty four. It's just like like that's that's just oh I. See, we're already losing viewers on YouTube. Just even talking about Ryan Tannehill, and possibly like you know what would have been the dream team though: Danucci, Devito, and Minshew. Boom! Minshew would have been fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Minshew at least would have been fun. Minshew would have now been to fun. be fair and effective. There, there are some pretty good free agent quarterbacks next season. Yeah, but if they're all they going to stay. Decide to punt on a, well, maybe no way like, they punt like Dak Prescott. Right, Jared Goff, he's probably gonna stay. Jordan Love's probably gonna stay. Trevor Lawrence, probably Tua, Trey Lance, nope. Justin Fields. Tua's staying. They're working on a contract extension right now. Okay, so all of them. Are, Hartman, it is. All of them are gonna stay. That's just that's the thing. It's like it's a great QB free agency class. It's you know I will say this though, like. The idea of them, well, here, well, it's a, it's another reason why going with a young quarterback is so big. <clears throat> like, they will have a hundred million dollars, a hundred million dollars in cap space to work with. That is ideal for you to work with a young quarterback. And so, if you actually are looking at, uh, if you actually are looking at it from this, from the maybe like positions of where they could probably add next year. I'd go look at the wide receiver room next year in free agency because it is loaded at that wide receiver room in free agency. So you could possibly, you know, spend the bag and bring a wide receiver in. And maybe that's when you can actually go out and get a wide receiver one. Truthfully, uh, you know, aside from, you know, developing your, you know, your wide receivers that you have in the room. Um, well, and that but, also depends on the contracts you're going to have to sign for Sertan. Quinn Miners is going to need but one. That's... I'm just saying, like, you saw what Jerry Sneed signed for. Like, Sertan's going to get more than that. But the, you're not, you're, but still, we're talking about $100 million in cap space. That, that deal's not going to suck up like 50% of their. Is that, know, is that $100 million well, after? Probably be the, loaded. Yeah. Is that $100 million after the 37 for Russell? Yes. Interesting. Yeah, they're going to have some significant fundage. Yeah, we're going after Dak Prescott. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's just for me, it's just the whole thing of the Broncos have done that yep. before. Oh, it's have done that multiple times. Yep. I, I don't understand why free agent quarterbacks who have been discarded from their original team, if Dak Prescott hits the free agent market. There's very strong reasons why the Dallas Cowboys elected to move on because they didn't think he was the guy that could get them over the hump. What? 
on this earth would make people think that Dak Prescott in Denver would get the Broncos over the hump. Sean Payton, with his arrogance, maybe would think that he could, yeah. Mm -hmm. But knowing who Dak Prescott is as a player, that he crumbles and shows his true colors when he's needed the most, he beats up on bad defenses. He carves them up. He's yeah. great at it. But when he actually has to play a defense who can legitimately give him a give him looks that could confuse him, no, Dak Prescott crumbles like a deck of cards. Even against a freaking Joe Barry defense in that playoff game, Dak Prescott played horrible. Yes, his own defense cracked <laughs> the bed in that game. I'm not going to say that that didn't happen, but Dak Prescott also played like absolute crap in that game. Booty cheeks. Yep, absolute booty <laughs> cheeks. Absolute booty cheeks. And he also played like absolute booty those. cheeks in the playoff games against the 49ers in the two previous years. Dak yeah. Prescott has as good of a team as he could possibly have around him and still shrivels in the biggest moments. Yeah. The Broncos would make a big mistake bringing him in. I step off the show, the soapbox. <laughs> and, but you know what, too, Gage is like, look at Dallas fans. They're not clamoring and saying, like, what are we doing not extending him? Like, we're, we're exposing this guy to free agency next year. This is crazy. Like, what, what are we thinking? They're not saying that. Yeah. Dallas fans that I know are completely fine with what's happening down there. What? And Not from a winning standpoint, but from a personnel standpoint, and maybe it's time that, it, that we, they move on. And so, like for me, it's like it isn't really so much that I would, I wouldn't mind Dak Prescott here, like because the, the the part that I think about it, like with Dak Prescott, is well, he would actually finally have a coach that actually he could work with, an offensive coach that he could work with. Not, you know, uh, clock management, you know, bonehead, you know, McCarthy over there in Dallas that he could actually work with him. Uh, you know, and actually get something out of him. And so I think it would actually be beneficial. However, my step back is just all related to they have, and you, you touched on it, you know, Gage, and actually it's something we've said numerous, numerous times in correlation to this particular draft class and just even adding a veteran in general, but it's like they have gone down that Peyton Manning rabbit hole far too much. Like, uh, I mean, and even so, I I wouldn't even use the word Band-Aid, you know, like, because Dak, Dak Prescott's not necessarily a Band-Aid, but the idea of bridge quarterbacks, like the whole point of bringing a bridge quarterback like a Joe Flacco in or a Case Keenum in was for them to be a bridge. Well, you can't be a bridge quarterback if there's nothing behind you. And that was the case for the Broncos. They had nothing behind them, you know, for them to even go to. You can make maybe a case for Drew Locke, but... Even then, he was a second round draft pick. And are we really, you know, putting a lot of first round for a reason? Exactly. And, yeah. and so I, I think that, like, we've just been down that rabbit hole far too often. And especially in this day and age of the NFL, what are the more successful quarterbacks in the NFL right now? Young, developed quarterbacks, right? And so, like, just get me a young, developed quarterback out of this class, frankly. You know, I, I really wouldn't even mind if I was sold on a Michael Pratt idea, right? Just because of the Tulane connection, you know, it's close to Sean connections to the uh, to the Saints, you know, so I mean, so I wouldn't I wouldn't I could be sold on a guy like that knowing what's what Sean could work with. But like, I just love the idea that like, go find your quarterback, go be sold on all six of these quarterbacks and knowing the fact that you could take any of these guys and mold them to be a top 12 quarterback in the NFL. And I think that that alone should excite Bronco fans that that's what they should do. Go take a Michael Penix. Everybody's been hating on Michael Penix. Go take a Michael Penix and, you know, say the biggest screw you to a lot of Bo Nix fans or JJ McCarthy fans that didn't want Michael Penix and go turn him into a top 12 you know, quarterback. And then at that point, you know what? Those Michael Penix haters are actually going to be, you know what? I was wrong. I was wrong about Michael Penix Jr., which, you know what? Based on the storyline, based on the storyline of Michael Penix Jr., I would not be surprised if he actually ended up being that kind of quarterback because it seems like those kind of quarterbacks, like, you know, work out. Not necessarily himself, but like just that style of quarterback in the sense of everybody's kind of doubting him. Everybody's, you know, doing, you know, all of this. Like Drake May's kind of falling himself into that conversation right now. Like, so I would not be surprised, you know, if, 
you know, we're actually talking about Michael Penix, and this is to what you were talking about even earlier in the show, Glenn. And like, I would not be surprised if Michael Penix is the one where we're talking about, you know, not necessarily the highest ceiling of the entire group, but just one that like you're talking about, like with Sean, you've got something there. Yep. I got to be honest, my one of my comps, it's not a complete thorough comp. It's kind of like a 50-50 comp here. To a tongue of Iloa is a partial comp for me for Michael Penix Jr. It's not just the left-handedness. It's just his ability to throw with anticipation. It's, again, my biggest reserve for Michael Penix is when the play breaks down, things get out of structure, he gets happy feet sometimes. It just kind of gets a little bit wonky with him. That's what I feel like my biggest downfall is for Penix. But at that same time, a lot of his shortcomings can be coached out of him. So mm -hmm. I think if he goes to the right situation, he could absolutely work out. He could absolutely be a starting caliber top 20 quarterback in the NFL, maybe even higher than that. He certainly has the arm talent. I'm not saying he doesn't. Oh, yeah, I think that he could definitely do that. And if Michael Penix is drafted by the Broncos, I will absolutely embrace him. And if he ends up being successful in the NFL, I will be the first person to yeah. eat a big fat helping a crow. Yeah. You know, I, my comparison as far as a high end ceiling for him would be almost like a left handed Matt Stafford. Like, Ooh. Uh, uh, oh my gosh. I'd yeah. take that. I would too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause like, I, I just think that like, I wanted that when it was the real Matt Stafford. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I I just think that like he he can make all the throws like he can make all the throws, um like he's actually got a much much better arm than Tua Tagovailoa. I actually think he's a better quarterback than Tua Tagovailoa. Um and you know which by the way kudos to Joe Clatt for actually saying this. He actually feels like uh he would not mind the Miami Dolphins taking Michael Penix Jr. Uh, and then moving on from Tua Tagovailoa, and then that's your quarterback. Because as far as what they do, you know, or what they would ideally like to do with my. But the thing there is like when I'm connecting the dots. Well, who just so happens to be a pretty nice fit for Sean Payton, Tua Tagovailoa. So it's like I I, I kind of look at it from the same light. If you're really looking at it from the time the, from the the quarterbacks and stuff like timing, anticipation, how they manipulate the pocket. He only scrambled eight times at Washington. Like, and a lot of that was the offense. So, like the fact that he was basically turned into a pocket passer really didn't use his legs all that often. He's got it in him, coach him up, maybe mold him to be that kind of guy. I, I really would not be upset at all with the idea of Penix. I, I always said he's the wild card of the entire top six bunch for the Broncos. And, you know, for them, you know, in the sense of like an actual fit for, with Sean. Cause I, I think that with what he could do, I think he could actually do a lot of things. The unfortunate thing is just uh, something that I think has been said numerous, numerous times is he is left-handed. So what do you do, you know, with the offensive line? Because, you know, Garrett Bowles is not necessarily his blindside, you know, blocker. You would be talking about Mike McGlinchey being his blindside blocker. You know, the, and I think the thing I was just say there as well, the good news is, you know, you know, Sean Payton, Zach Streif, they are very offensive line heavy. So they would have a plan uh, no matter what what it would be. Um, and, fr and, and frankly, it actually might even make Garrett Bowles a, better, a much, much better left tackle than he actually has been in the NFL. Well, think about this too. I mean, the Miami Dolphins have an offensive line that's more structured for a right-handed quarterback. They've got Teron Armstead at left tackle. And then right tackle, they have Austin Jackson, who's the inferior tackle here. So I think that even <coughs> if you're designing your offensive line for a left-handed quarterback, it's okay to have your superior tackle be your left tackle still. Um, Mike McGlinchey being a blindside protector does worry me a little bit, but the Dolphins are, have gotten away with it with Austin Jackson. I think the Broncos could get away with it as well. And on that note, that is going to do it for the 5280s mock draft. Uh, I think we got a pretty good grade on it. JJ McCarthy fell, so we to, yeah. We passed. Yeah. Our, right. our, 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 our morning classes, we did well. The afternoon course is not so good. <laughs> there we go. I mean, but that yeah, middle sure, round, uh, I think we cut. I thought so, too. I, I thought so. Uh, but make sure you like, subscribe, 
make sure you hit that thumbs up. The thumbs up is the easiest way and the best way to support any show on the network. We got shows Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday with the neighborhood on Sundays on game days. We're also, there you go. We're also going to be doing the Avalanche playoff run uh, on the neighborhood. So make sure you check that out. We're also going to be live streaming the first round of the NFL draft. So make sure you tune into that. We're going to be doing the neighborhood for that. So it should be fun. Everybody can join if they want. It would be more, the more the merrier is basically what we want to do. Uh, well, except Cam, because he's going to Nebraska. And nobody the hell wants to come here. I don't know why you are. You literally are. live there. I know, and I don't want to be here. Uh, but yeah, make sure you check out. I keep spending a for sale sign in his front yard, and his wife keeps. And everybody it out. keeps taking it down. <laughs> And Mike lives in, like, <laughs> rural Nebraska. He doesn't even live in, like, Omaha, the big city part of Nebraska. No, I live in Nebraska, Nebraska. Yeah, Nebraska, Nebraska. <laughs> That's where all the corn's at. That's where I'm – if you get to corn. Nebraska and see corn, I'm around there somewhere. He said corn. He, he said corn, right? Okay. Corn or corn, whichever one you want. <laughs> I mean, you're probably corn closer to my house boat. if it's at the corn area. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, to be to be fair, <laughs> absolute booty cheeks. Do a segment on MHRT Network, Port on the Cob, live from Nebraska. <laughs> yeah, that's the next podcast name. <laughs> that's if uh, that's what if Randall Cobb gets into the business after he retires. Right? Yeah. There we go. All right, so that's going to do it for us. We love Broncos country. We love the Broncos. Make sure you tune in on draft day, and if you can take. Any single thing away from this podcast. The answer is Ryan Tannehill and Sam Hartman. We'll see you guys later. Peace. Back lane when I pass in the street. Bag of money in the passenger seat. Temple's been asking for me on the road from the west to the east. Way up, I might never come down. Cause the coast racking up the flame out. So high, I might never come down.